Well, our guest for today is Twitter personality or X personality, I should say, Raw Egg Nationalist, who has had many appearances in media over the past few years, was in Tucker Carlson's The End of Men documentary, and is the editor-in-chief of Man's World magazine, which is a great publication that's doing a lot of really interesting aesthetic things. So, Raw Egg Nationalist, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for uh, coming today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm really looking forward to speaking. Great. So why don't we get started? For those of our viewers who aren't as familiar with you as some of the other people that will live on Twitter, essentially, or live on X, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you started your social media personality and some of the activities you're involved in? Yeah, of course. Well, it started off, it started off as a I just had a lurker account really i was uh i was a fan of bronze age pervert i read bronze age mindset when that came out in 2018 i seem to remember and i was just sort of lurking around twitter following bronze age pervert laughing at his tweets laughing at the tweets of of sort of some other people in his circle didn't really have any particular ambition to tweet um although i i, I was a writer before that so i was writing stuff but um things really start things really started to change at the beginning of the pandemic uh i got behind uh this hashtag that was going around on uh twitter hashtag raw egg nationalism so i wasn't i didn't coin the term raw egg nationalism although i uh, did become the raw egg nationalist um i got behind the hashtag and i and i started slonking raw eggs and i loved it and uh started posting rebranded myself if you will as the raw egg nationalist uh and i I wrote a cookbook in the summer of 2020 uh and that was really the beginning of the of the real madness that really took off uh i I had it as a as a free pdf for people to download on a just on a, a file sharing website and tens of thousands in fact in the end hundreds of thousands of people downloaded it and uh, that was really the beginning. That was when I started to take off. I started Man's World, which is my men's magazine. It's like, a, I suppose you could say it's an updated version of Playboy for the massively online internet generation. So it's it's an attempt to sort of make men's magazines great again, because at the moment they're pretty pretty bloody awful to be honest with you playboy has has lost its way it lost its way a long time ago and i wanted to revive the spirit of the classic men's magazine as a way to spread our ideas our aesthetic on the dissident right the ideas of bronze age mindset my own ideas and uh that started out as a just as a just as a digital only uh project something of a meme if you will i sort of memed myself into doing it but it's really taken off now we have the man's world annual which is a hardcover annual that comes out every year like the classic playboy annual it's published by antelope hill and that features uh the best essays of the year yeah this is the 2023 one the art of the meal we've uh riffed on the the famous trump art of the deal book for the uh, outer aesthetic for the annual that's available from antelope hill and now the magazine is also available uh to order as a physical magazine via passage press so we, we're actually the first issue is coming out you can order it now but the first issue is coming out in april we're going to have two issues two physical issues this year probably more the year after this is sort of like a test run if you will we're just making sure that we've got the logistics and everything else sorted for the magazine because it's a big undertaking to print and distribute a magazine and that's one of the reasons actually why i uh, up to this point before i before i got together with the good people at passage press this is one of the reasons why the magazine was digital only because you know it's just uh, for one person to not only to put together but also to print and distribute a magazine it's just it's just too much as you know as as much uh, as as much as i like work and as as much as i as much as i do it was it was beyond my capacity so i'm a writer i produce my own stuff i've written a number of books my latest book is the eggs benedict option um uh, which is a riff on Rod Dreher's Benedict Option that came out last summer. I'm currently in um, negotiation with actually with a with a major publisher, believe it or not, to uh, to write another book this year, which is tentatively titled The Last Men: Liberalism and the Death of Masculinity, and it's 
expanding on some of the themes of the Tucker Carlson documentary, The End of Men, which I was one of the main sort of uh, stars of, I suppose. Uh, and that came out last year. That was about testosterone decline and masculinity. And uh, it generated <laughs> an hysterical response uh, from the liberal commentariat. It was very, very funny. I ended up going on Tucker Carlson. Um, so I've got I've got quite a few I've got my quite a few fires uh, quite a few irons in the fire uh, at the moment, but um, it's pretty great. Seems seems to be going quite well, I would say. Yeah, I would definitely say so too. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the Tucker Carlson documentary. When I was prepping for the interview, I was reminded of that Daily Beast rant that came out that called you a a Twitter troll, which I got a good chuckle out of. Um, I enjoyed the documentary. I know Davis and I, my editor, have talked a lot about it. So. For those people who have looked at your your X page, um, you know we know there are a few causes that you're passionate about. One of them is obviously what you talked about with Tucker Carlson. But how would you describe sort of your three primary causes that you advocate for and that you discuss? And also, as a side note to that, do you think the media has done an accurate job describing your positions on these issues? Uh, well, let let me answer the let me answer the the second question first no i mean no of course not they don't have it they don't have any interest at all in characterizing my position accurately i mean it's just straw man after straw man uh but i'll get i'll get back into that in a moment but what are what are the main causes that i champion well i mean it's it's partly in the name roeg nationalist roeg nationalism i i am a champion of of a particular political philosophy which you could call nationalism but at the same time, I'm well, I suppose I suppose you could put it like this. A nation is only as strong as the individuals of which it is composed. So I'm I'm interested, obviously, in, in strengthening the nation. But that also means strengthening the, the individual. So. A good deal of what I write about and a good deal of what I what I talk about in my podcast appearances, etc., is ways in which we can improve our individual health, basically food lifestyle things like improving your sleep even uh but especially and i suppose this could this could be a separate cause of its own uh reducing your exposure to harmful industrial chemicals and especially to a class of chemicals known as endocrine disruptors which basically affect the body's endocrine that's the hormone system uh and and most of them are are estrogenic so what that means is that they these artificial chemicals that in the body mimic the effects of the female, in inverted commas, uh, hormone estrogen. And that's a very, very bad thing. It throws the body's hormonal system out of whack. It affects development at every stage of, of life from conception in the womb, you know, through through adolescence, puberty, uh, even into, into adulthood. And that was actually one of the principal focuses of the Tucker Carlson documentary was the havoc that industrial chemicals are causing to, uh, to gender and, and to masculinity in particular. So I suppose that's another focus too, masculinity, uh, the necessity of masculinity uh, in the face of a, a coordinate, a massive coordinated assault, not only within the culture, because I think it's quite obvious, uh, especially from the reaction to the Tucker Carlson documentary, that the culture is profoundly anti-masculine. But there is also this biological assault that is taking place due to industrial chemicals, due to the way that we live, due to the lifestyle, the plastic-based lifestyle that we now live, our dependence on plastics. So bas basically, Yes, I'm talking about the relationship between individual health and national health. That's 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 the overarching theme. But then there are then there are sort of multiple individual themes within that as well, like harmful chemicals, masculinity, etc. Yeah. So there seems to be sort of this interesting mix of of political philosophies in in what you're talking about. You know, one twenty years ago. This was the kind of stuff for the Whole Foods granola crowd, right? That you know you're getting yeah. your you're getting your plastic bottle, or your glass bottle. Um, but also, it seems to be sort of an updating of you know the idea of muscular Christianity from the British Empire, so the last kind of version of the British Empire with writers like Conrad and A. E. W. Mason. Um, why do you think this issue 
has shifted right and been perceived as a right-leaning issue since really the pandemic. I mean, it seems like that's when this sort of started, this idea of the health benefits of you know, local eating, um, avoiding chemicals, has suddenly shifted to be this this right cause. Like what what caused that shift? I think it's I think that shift has actually been taking place over a longer period of time than that. So I mean I yeah, it is a it is a it's an interesting observation that actually so much of what I talk about and so much of what people within my circles, even stuff that Bronze Age Pervert talks about in Bronze Age mindset, is actually stuff that you yeah, you might have heard coming from the mouth of a or from the pen of a of a granola munching hippie in the 1960s i mean yeah there is there is a very very strong environmental focus and a focus on uh fortifying your body with healthy uh organic foods in particular grass-fed beef you know there's there's a, there's a there's a distinct emphasis on what you might call terroir you know the provenance of food that, that is important and that was very definitely a a, um, a concern principally of the left and of of the sort of hippie left in particular until reasonably recently i mean one of the things that i that i like to say is that you know there's there's absolutely no reason why conservatives shouldn't have have um shouldn't care about these issues and the fact that they haven't for so long is actually an indictment of conservatism in many respects but if 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 we're trying to think about uh why this shift has happened i i think we have to look at i think we have to look at what happened among other things with occupy wall street and the kind of changes that happened in the global left as a result of the failure of the occupy movement i won't go into it in too much detail but the failure the occupy movement was kind of the last gasp of uh, in many respects, of traditional leftism, of a traditional economically oriented leftism that pitted that pitted class interests against each other, basically. Um, and since then, what's happened, and I think this has been a deliberate strategy on the part of corporations. Corporations have fostered have fostered this. The left has the left has actually been seduced into a into a very cozy relationship with corporations. You know, previously the left was was heavily anti corporation. You know, the left the left were the people you would hear um, decrying corporate greed and corporate pollution of the environment because, of course, this pollution that is taking place is 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 caused by corporations. It's also caused by the military and, and organizations that aren't sort of corporate based, but it is principally corporations that are polluting the environment with estrogenic chemicals, et cetera. Um, but there was this, there was this accommodation, I think, between the left and corporations that was fostered by corporations. They promoted identity politics because it serves their purposes. And I mean, there was that wonderful memo that was leaked from, from Whole Foods about the fact that, um, you know, they like hiring a diverse workforce because diverse workforces don't unionize. Um, you know, it, it's it's in the corporate interests, I think, to sh has been in corporate interests since the, the big scare of Occupy Wall Street to divert attention away from economic issues towards issues of identity, in particular, the minutiae of 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 identity politics. The, the sort of um, endless regress that takes place, you know, where you're where you're creating ever ever more marginalised identities, and everyone's disappearing into their own um, navel or up their own backside. Um, so, so I mean, I think that there's, I think that there's, there's definitely something about the changing nature of the left that we have to contend with. I mean, that's the that's the kind of explanation that I've sort of thrashed out in my mind is that actually it is something to do with the way that the left has changed in, in very re in recent decades and, and made a sort of accommodation with corporate power because ultimately it is corporations that are that are polluting the environment in in the way that um, that it, that is so um, that is so devastating, but 
but also the thing is, you know, things like vegan diets, you know, you talk about a, a global plant based diet, for instance, which has been it's been a focus of my work to talk about this vision of a plant based future and what it would actually entail. And of course, it entails basically total corporate ownership of the food supply. And the left is totally happy with this. The, the you know, the, the what was once the anti corporate left is now totally happy with corporations being in full control of the food supply, producing all of these alternative proteins, the uh, lab-grown meat, all this kind of stuff, having you know, these big bug farms and and uh, producing, you know, all, the, all these all these uh, plant-based meats and you know, Beyond Burger, all that kind of stuff. Um, so there's something, yeah, there's some something has happened, I think, to to draw the left in much closer to corporate power than it ever was before. But then there is also, yes, I think there is also the effects of the the pandemic uh, that we need to contend with. I mean, the pandemic was a was a was a tremendous demonstration of how power today, freedom is. Um, is a matter of is a matter of health is a matter of individual and public health how they are how they are totally inextricably linked and i think that the the sort of uh, anti lockdown measures or the anti lockdown crowd rather you know were it, it became very clear that actually a different vision of of health of public health would have to be part of of sort of resisting the lockdown measures and the medical tyranny basically that was brought in so i mean i think i think it's quite complicated i think there are multiple strands but it it definitely is the case absolutely is the case now that that a lot of this you know gran granola granola hippie stuff is now actually considered firmly uh firmly a, a uh, the province of the right and i don't think that that's a bad thing at all i think that that's good of course of course it leads to smears from the mainstream media you know this is fascism etc um but so many of those smears i think are absurd for one thing you know to, to say that exercise is right wing which is something that actually you you see these ridiculous you know headlines there was a guardian headline i think um you know, are you working out? You're in danger of becoming a a, a far right uh, ghoul. You know, it was something. It was something like that. Some something absurd. You know, but you actually see it. You actually see it on a on a fairly regular basis. And it was something that was very noticeable in the reception of the Tucker Carlson end of men documentary. So it's um it's a change in many ways that actually I think is is very very welcome and it and it corrects a uh, long standing deficit uh, a long-standing blind spot in conservative and right-wing thinking so your ideological standpoint shares a lot with jordan peterson and tucker carlson um we had carlson's biographer chadwick moore on a couple of months ago and he talked about this ability of carlson to attract this demographic to fox news that otherwise doesn't watch the show which is the 20 to 45 crowd um, how does your viewpoint of masculinity or the way that you, your conception of masculinity, how does that dovetail and how does that differ from figures like Carlson or Jordan Peterson? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Jordan Peterson gets a lot of flack actually from, from uh, people who are further right from him. And as obviously he gets a lot of flack from the left as well. But I think that actually, I think that actually we should be grateful for the, Jordan Peterson phenomenon for the most part. I mean, he's, I suppose you could call him a gateway drug if you wanted to, you know, I mean, he's, he sets a lot of people, a lot of aimless young men off on the right path, I think. And, and we should be thankful for that. I mean, he is very, very desperate to cling to the center ground and, and to, to, you know, to be the 19th century liberal. Um, uh, and I mean, I think that that is uh, at this stage that that's a pretty futile position to adopt. But things have gone far, far beyond that. But I think that I mean, I think that his focus on the plight of young men, on the necessity of self mastery, and the need for strong expressions of masculinity, traditional expressions of masculinity, including violence, is is definitely is definitely welcome uh 
I mean, I think that his sole focus on the individual because of his fear of collectivism, of the, you know, of the road to the gulag and the road to the extermination camp, to the gas chambers, all that sort of stuff. I think that, I think that, um, I think that that's mis, I think that that's misplaced. I think that's a, a dead end. And I, I certainly don't think that, um, you can really build a, a you can really build a, a, a sort of workable political philosophy from from Jordan Peterson's work, but I think that the I think that the starting point is right. The starting point with the individual and the, the focus on the individual and the focus on the plight of, of of young men is is very very powerful and very welcome. I mean, he he talks about biology as well, and biology is something you know that I talk about a lot. Hormones. He doesn't. I don't know that he, I mean, I don't know that he's ever talked about endocrine disruptors. He's he's interviewed RFK Jr., I seem to remember, and RFK Jr. did talk about gender-bending chemicals and the, and the, the gay frogs uh, thesis and all that sort of stuff. But um, I would say that my focus in terms of masculinity, as, as well as, as well as focusing on, let's say, the formation of groups, so one term that you hear bandied about a lot is the manabund which is a which is a you know like a group of of like-minded individuals who band young men who band together in pursuit of a of some sort of higher shared goal and they you know that is that is something that i promote i've 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 always promoted friendship and and trying to trying to trying to bring young men together in in shared worthwhile pursuits in pursuit of of worthwhile goals but so that's that's how i think i differ slightly from jordan peterson or maybe quite a lot from jordan peterson but then i I would say that my focus is much more is much more biological than his and probably much more biological than a lot of a lot of um sort of more mainstream proponents of of uh, sort of renewed masculinity i don't despite the tucker garlson documentary i still don't think that all of this stuff about endocrine disruptors about harmful chemicals is is mainstream yet and that's one of the reasons why i'm writing this new book that i'm writing because i i want to make the case that actually we need to do something if we if we want to do something about the decline of masculinity and obviously i think we should for various reasons, then we're going to need to do something about these harmful endocrine disrupting chemicals, these toxic chemicals that are everywhere because they are having terrible, terrible effects, including potentially actually making the species infertile, totally infertile. So there are predictions. There's a prediction by a one of the world's foremost reproductive health experts, a woman called uh, Professor Shanna Swan, who's at Mount Sinai, New York. Uh, her prediction simply based on on current trends is that by 2045 the median man will have a sperm count of zero and what that means basically is that one half of all men will produce no sperm whatsoever and the other half will produce so few that they might as well produce none and so what that means simply you know from extrapolation of current trends what that means is that by 2045 we may not be able to reproduce as a species without some form of artificial intervention and that's that's pretty scary you know that's not a long that's not a long time you know, it's 20 years 21 years it sounds like definite pd james children of men type scenario that, that we're facing um speaking of sort of artistic representations of masculinity you recently published a piece uh, called The Dissident Artist that caught my attention, and it was about sort of the failures of right-wing art. The subtitle is A Case Study in Failure. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what piqued your interest in this piece enough to publish it and feature it in the magazine? Yeah, yeah, I will. I mean, it was, so we have in the magazine, then we have each month, uh, or each month rather, each issue, because the issues come out maybe every three months, sort of a quarterly magazine i suppose um we have a a central polemical essay which is called the counterblast essay and uh it's really it's meant to be like a shot across the bows it's about to be some it's meant to be about some kind of topic that uh you know that will really get people talking and really make people 
really make people think, make people respond on Twitter, maybe write, make people write an essay in response. And we've had some counter blast essays that have generated quite um, some quite vigorous discussion. And we have Twitter spaces, etc., uh, where we talk about them as well. But this one in particular is about is about the dissident, the figure of the dissident artist and how actually, for the most part, the dissident artist is a loser and he lacks he lacks institutional support he he lacks a clear project and actually what's even worse i think is that the dissident artist who would be an artist on the right today of course uh is happy with that you know and it, this is something this is something that we see not just with artists on the right but also with with various other figures on the right commentators etc that that the right has the right has has lost so much over such a long period that we're so many of us are just totally habituated to being in the position of the loser and never being able to achieve anything and never really getting anywhere and uh it's yeah it's it's uh it's a mindset that we need to get out of but um i, I mean i'd like to ask you wh what did you like about this essay in particular um, well, what really struck me about it is just sort of the influx that we've had recently on the right of these siloed preaching to the choir products. I mean, I'm thinking mm. of a lot of the the Daily Wire um, projects like like Lady Ballers that you know are very like pale imitations of you know actual dissonant. But I think this is also going yeah. on on the left as well, where you know, ever more so, it's it's very hard to find a lot of you know common culture because we have these moments inserted into large blockbusters um you know i recently saw aquaman 2 and it's this very hand-fisted global warming climate change not really well thought through allegory yeah. which means you know it's one of the reasons that movie i think is not doing well is it's so disingenuous so you know the the idea that the rights approach is such an abysmal failure is something i think a lot of people have not called out and that was one of the things that really stuck with me the other thing which actually leads to um a question i was going to ask you is this idea of you know right artists keeping their head down um, and not necessarily infiltrating systems, which I think is like a a Sololinsky rules for radicals type move, but you know playing the game, knowing how to you know get things financed, which is really is a very conservative line of thought. You know this to me is something that in the 1970s, you know, within institutions like Hollywood or the publishing industry. A lot of writers would have been doing this anyway, but now it's coming off as kind of a novelty. So those were sort of the, the ideas that really appealed to me is that like setting up you know, the right wing version of Hershey's or the right wing version of Hollywood is doomed to fail because it doesn't have any any underpinning or any purpose besides that. Um, you know, we see this in Christian movies. We see this in a lot of different areas. So that was what really appealed to me. And I found so refreshing that I was you know sharing this with with everybody that that I knew um, so do you agree with that approach? And this kind of leads me to another question I wanted to ask you of infiltrating the systems, um, of, you know, being part of the system and preserving that individual vision. I, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, it's, guys, it's such a, it's such a complex problem. And I think that, well, I mean, what's evident to me is that there is a tendency, certainly on the right for purity spiraling, where, what matters more than anything else is just to preserve one's one's purity you know we must preserve the pu purity of the ideals we we must be we must you know we can't be we can't compromise in any sense we can't um we can't make accommodations uh in the short term for some sort of longer term aim you know it's just we've we've got to cleave to we've got to cleave to our ideals even in the face of in even in the face of massive possibly existential defeat uh i mean i think i think that it's impossible you know, you mentioned saul alinsky's rule for rules for radicals we need to be studying the left we need to understand how the left how we've come to this juncture where the left has so much cultural power so much economic power so much um so much power full stop you know and 
one of I mean one of the reasons one of the reasons why the left has cultural power is because the right has simply surrendered to the cultural terrain. The right didn't think that culture was important. The right was concerned with with economics and politics, but not with culture. The right was concerned with those things, but not with education. So we allowed the great universities to be infiltrated and subverted. And that is, that's just Gramsci. That's just the long march through the institutions. And they said they were going to do it and they did it. Um, I mean, I write, I have written a number of different pieces for American Mind and also for Human Events. And I think for some other people, possibly even in the magazine uh, in Man's World, about the rights failure to grasp very very basic political principles like for instance carl schmidt's friend enemy distinction uh you know the left the left rewards its allies uh, rewards its friends and punishes its enemies and the right can't even do that you know what the right does is the right punches right you have a you have a more moderate right that punches right all the time in order to secure favor from the left and from the center or what what appears to be the center but is actually the left um and it's it's absurd and and you know i i i talk i i wrote a an, an article for american mind called friends and enemies where i said you know like we're, we're going to end up in this situation where actually the last two conservatives are, you know, being lined up against the wall and they say, um, oh, the left, are, you know, the left are the real hypocrites. Uh, they murder, you know, they, they say that they believe in, you know, justice and blah, blah, blah. And here they are murdering us. And, you know, a bullet goes off, the gun goes off and they're and they're dead. I mean, it's like there comes a point, I think, where where principles where where sort of vying for principles and and the marketplace of ideas and and open discussion all these kinds of things i mean they're luxuries really and i think that we've reached a point where actually the right needs to get serious about the fact that actually the left is committed to destroying the right forever if it can and that actually the current strategies, the strategies that the right has been following for decades have failed utterly and something else needs to happen. And so, you know, the, the, the plight of the dissident artist, well, that's a, that's a microcosm of the bigger problem that faces the right today, which is uh, how, do we, how do we wrest power from the left? How do we uh, support ourselves and, you know, and reward our how do we reward our our friends and and punish our enemies and how ultimately do we you know grasp hold of the reins of power and keep a hold of them as well and um i mean yeah the question the question of infiltrating institutions is is a difficult one because it would you know what once upon a time it was quite normal to have conservative university professors there are still some of course, there are still some in in particular kinds of settings, in particular departments. But you're not going to find a conservative professor in an English lit department, or in a or in a, a languages a, a, a languages department, or in a you know sociology department, probably, or anywhere like that. You might find a conservative professor in a economics, maybe, or in the natural sciences. But but even then, they're probably likely to keep it to themselves. Um, the problem now, of course, is that the infiltration, I think, is going to be very, very difficult, very, very difficult indeed. And so then the question arises, well, actually, I mean, we need institutions. We need institutions. Of course, we need institutions because institutions are the basis of, of power. They're the basis of the state uh, and they're the basis of the broader civil society. So we need institutions maybe what we have to do is create parallel institutions and then you know we have to you can look at what someone like christopher rufo is doing i mean he's he's you know helped to take over a failing institution and and turn it round and maybe that will provide a provide an example for others to follow i i hope it does because he he strikes me as one of the few realists on the right today who is actually committed to getting his hands dirty and actually doing something in a way that is constructive and 
it doesn't is isn't just sort of um isn't just sort of occupied with these theoretical concerns about you know what should we what should we be doing at this at this particular juncture i think that the of course we've got to think of course we've got to think but at the same time we've got to act because because we are at a an incredibly dangerous juncture and i wanted to talk about those two approaches um so i was shocked earlier this week whenever claudine gay resigned and a lot of university professors that I follow on Twitter, because I, I I am in academia as well as writing for the pamphleteer, but in addition to sort of defending what was clear plagiarism um, by the book, student would have felt the glass plagiarism. They talked about that outside of Rufo, that the right is just about a dozen anons, which I guess, you know, you would be included in that um, by yeah. definition, who were causing all of these problems and all of this rabble rousing. So, you know, the essay that you published talks about this idea of just keeping your head down and going through the institutions. Um, and then we have people like Rufo who are very much sort of branding themselves in this way that like they are, you know, they're out there, they're taking the consequences. They know they're going to be blacklisted. Yeah. Um, I would even say somebody like Steve Bannon is the same way, or, you know, mm -hmm. even Steve Mnuchin to a, to a lesser degree that, you know, are changing their out there. They're not anonymous. Um, you know, three years ago, I would have said that there's no way for anybody in any institution to survive. Um, and yeah. I'm thinking about the case, and this is something I'm talking about next week uh, in the pamphleteers, kind of the case of Bretty Stanellis, who was this, you know, massive cultural force throughout the 80s and the 90s, wrote the book White, was canceled, and then somehow in the time since 2020 has come back, you know, his novel was a New York Times bestseller. He's getting an HBO adaptation of that. Um, so he's sort of been able to, to come back into mainstream culture without sort of changing his views or without going through this struggle session. So, you know, where, where does the idea of anonymity fit in? I mean, do you think that's something that um, people with your ideological bent are eventually going to be able to abandon? Or do you think that that actually is a, a tool um, that, has more benefits than it has costs. I think, I mean, in an ideal world, yeah, no, nobody would have to express themselves uh, anonymously. I would rather not have to address uh, to um, express myself anonymously. But I do feel that actually, at this particular juncture, this particular moment, then it's impossible. Very few people can speak freely, even even the even the most powerful people in the world, even the richest people in the world even elon musk you know having taken over twitter he actually can't speak freely he can speak he can speak more freely perhaps than than others and of course what he has is he has money and uh i mean he has a particular personality as well that maybe inclines him to you know not to care about the the consequences of what he of 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 what he says but actually fundamentally he has a massive amount of money and so you know oh you could can you could cancel elon musk you know you, but he's still he's still he'll still be alive he still has a way of making a living you know he'll still be he'll still be scraping along regardless of whether or not he is cancelled as it were and whether or not people you know still think that he's great or not um but for individuals like me for ordinary people then the the dangers of speaking your mind freely are well i mean are, are very well known and i think everybody needs to study the case of ricky vaughan douglas mackey you know who is being prosecuted by the us by the federal government for making memes about hillary clinton but you know for making funny memes about hillary clinton he is being he is being um, prosecuted under an anti clan statute that was enacted in the 1870s to um, to criminalize voter suppression, violent voter suppression in the South uh, during Reconstruction by the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, it, it's it's an incredible it's an incredible overreach by the federal government, but they're getting away with it. They're getting away with it. And it's a statement of intent about freedom of expression, fundamentally. I mean, they're saying, look, we can, you know, you, may, you make a meme that maybe influences the course of an election. 
maybe it did i mean you know ricky ricky vaughan's memes were very popular and at the time of the 2016 election then he was deemed by various different sort of uh election observers uh institutions i think there was a poll or there was a, a ranking of uh you know the most influential people in the in the most influential influencers in the 2016 election and ricky vaughan was ranked ahead of drudge report and people like that so he was clearly perceived to be a very influential anonymous poster um uh but you know if, if you make memes that the that the government doesn't like then uh, you can go to prison, and you know, I mean, it's 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 crazy. I mean, if if you'd if you'd said that ten years ago, that that would that that would be the case, then you'd probably have been laughed at. But actually, that is the that is the uh, the juncture that we've reached now, and so I think that people 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 obviously do realise that we can't express ourselves freely, which is why there are so many anonymous accounts i mean obviously there are anonymous trolls there are people troll demons as uh, as jordan peterson likes to call them you know pe people who do just like to annoy people in the responses to tweets and and you know just just create a little bit of chaos i mean we all like to create a little bit of chaos but there are people who are fundamentally pursuing anonymity as a as a kind of ethic, as a political ethic, as a political tool. And I think that, I mean, I've written, I've written about the benefits of anonymity, the fact that for ordinary people, then, you know, the cloak of internet an anonymity is the closest they're going to get to being able to express themselves freely today. And it's absolutely something that should be, it's a right that should be protected and preserved. And I was actually, uh, to go back to Jordan Peterson, that was actually partially in response to Jordan Peterson's very, very angry denunciations of uh, internet anons in the aftermath of Elon Musk buying Twitter. I mean, Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson has a very personal beef, I think, with internet anons because they often, they often like to remind him of his daughter Michaela's dalliance in Romania with Andrew Tate, uh, and other stuff like that. And so, I mean, he has a, he very definitely has a personal gripe with internet anons, but I don't think that he, and this is what I say in the piece, I don't think that he sees the bigger picture. I don't think that he's pessimistic enough, as it were, about the state of free speech. And I don't think that actually, actually he, I think he fails to imagine himself in the position of an ordinary person trying to express themselves freely. So, you know, I mean, Jordan Peterson was subject to cancellation or attempted cancellation. You know, he was just an ordinary university professor who became a, uh, a first a sort of internet sensation, speaking out against Bill C-16 in Canada to do with... Um, mandatory pronouns and, and all that sort of stuff that, that most of you prob most of the listeners will probably know about you know but he but again he was operating from a position of power not obviously not as great a position of power as elon musk but he was a tenured university professor he was wealthy and uh he had the resources to weather the storm and most people don't most people you know will just be cancelled and disappear and you know may end up never being able to be employed again jordan peterson has has been catapulted to international superstardom really uh, as an intellectual figure but that isn't that isn't an option for the vast majority of people i mean as far as anons go i am a very successful anon you know i have made a i have now made a career where i'm writing books um uh, I've got my sub stack, you know, I make I make media appearances all the time, like, but that is very rare. There are only a few people like me. Um, and I'm still subject to cancellation, it might happen to me. And and who knows, I mean, I hopefully I would be able to weather it. But um, it's, 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 it's not clear. I mean, we are in, I think, in, in a certain certain fundamental respect of course we are in uncharted territory and we're just trying to trying to work things out as we go along but certainly 
as far as I can see it, then I think that anonymity is is a very powerful tool that needs to be protected because we do live in an unfree society now, an increasingly unfree society, despite despite the formal ideology, despite the the values that we all profess to hold, then we we don't live in a society where freedom of speech is upheld. Absolutely. And going back to your idea of anonymity and the common person, one of the things that I did disagree with in the dissident artist piece was the idea that if you don't get into Harvard or you don't get into USC, um, there's really no point in bothering with other institutions of higher learning or other local institutions. And, you know, as somebody that teaches at a regional university, um, and sort of sees this idea of regionalism. And I was also somebody who writes for a regional publication. Um, you know, there's, there seems to be a benefit to me of a regional place of learning, um, you know, a, whether that's a state school, whether that's a private, private religiously affiliated liberal arts college, um, as a way to kind of have a, a, a cultural palette, as a way to develop a regional culture. So, what role do you think regionalism plays in the kind of dissonance that this piece advocates? Yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think fundamentally you're right. I mean, I think if we are going to be building parallel institutions, and I do think that we need to build parallel institutions at this point, then certain things follow from that, certain, um, uh, certain indisputable facts. You know, if you're... <laughs> If you're building a, a parallel institution to Harvard, that means in some sense that Harvard is lost, you know, like these institutions that have been captured. I mean, we can make inroads into them, but actually you're not you're not um, you're not in control of them. And so, yes, I mean, I think that I think that you do. Yeah, you do. You do need other centers of, of higher learning. You can't abandon the centers of higher learning. And if Harvard is is ideologically captured to the extent that I think it is, and that that other people think it is, that it's reasonable to to think that it is, then actually, yeah, I think that um, I think that yes, we need yeah, we do need we do need regional power centres, and I think that for for all his faults, and I think I mean I think Ron DeSantis has has kind of embarrassed himself terribly with his presidential campaign. Then what he's been doing in Florida has been very instructive you know that is if you will that is a new kind of um there's a new kind of regionalism on display there if you will in the sense that he's trying to build florida up as a conservative stronghold and you've got people like christopher rufo who are you know turning around educational institutions in florida florida might not have been uh first choice for conservatives 10 years ago or, or even more recently than that, but now maybe it is, and now maybe you might consider to go to Christopher Rufo's university in Florida rather than another university. Um, I mean, I certainly, I think that it is. I think that it is a stupid idea to abandon, for the right to abandon universities altogether. I think that that's. I think that that's so 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 short sighted. I, th I, th I mean, what we need, and this is something actually that, uh, you know, this is something that applies across the board, really. What we need is we need, we need an approach, or we need multiple approaches on different levels. And so, yes, it may very well be appropriate for certain people, or more appropriate for certain people, rather, not to go to university now. It might be better for some people, actually, to to make a, a more sensible calculation about the costs of going to university and actually, you know, what they want to achieve and, and realize that maybe they could, they would be better served doing a trade and that they could be more successful. And, you know, if, if what you really want to have is you want to settle down and have a, a family and a home uh, you know, to reproduce, et cetera, then maybe actually, instead of instead of going to university yeah you might you might learn a trade and have a successful small business you know in in your town or, or wherever and find prosperity that way and and, and realize your your uh, aims that way but the universities we live in an accreditation based culture you know universities are universities provide the highest form of publicly recognized accreditation that there is and so what are we, what are we going to do are we just going to cease to 
if we cease to play that game, we cease to be able to basically to occupy any positions of power or privilege within society, you know. I mean it's it's not for it's not for nothing that all of the prime ministers of of the UK are Oxford or Cambridge educated for the most part. I um, you know, so it, again actually it strikes me as this sort of it's this kind of bizarre defeatist attitude that we have where we sort of throw our hands up in the air and say well well you know every 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 professor at um you know at the modern american university is a blue haired you know woke um karen uh so let's let's just stop going to university i mean it's it's so it's so it's so short sighted and it's so it's so stupid and what we actually need is we actually need a we need a thoughtful hard-headed realistic approach that, that that recognizes the reality of the situation the difficulty of the situation too i mean it's not easy nobody's saying that it's easy i'd be the last person to say that it's easy but we have to we have to do something and it it does it does bother me when i hear people slating people like christopher rufo in particular and you know i mean people have been saying about the about the claudine gay thing oh this is just uh this isn't a victory at all. In fact, actually, Christopher Rufo is just aiding the left. Um, uh, and he's he's actually doing harm to the right. He's doing more harm to the right than Claudine Gay was doing. And it's like, at a certain point, I actually just think, I don't even, I don't actually even know what the point of speaking to people who think like this is, you know? It's like, I, I, I can't, I don't know how I can communicate with you if you, if you really believe that. But... Yeah, I mean, I think to go back to the to the to the to the main point to the the focus of the question about regionalism. Then yes, I mean, we need to. I think that, I think that we're going to need regional strongholds. Certainly, we're going to need castles from which we can sally forth. You know, we need we need some territorial bases, because without territorial bases, then actually you don't have anything at all. Yeah, and something that's always bothered me, especially in the state of Tennessee, is that the way that our state deals with higher education here has been utterly remarked, unremarked upon um, in, in mainstream media. So DeSantis gets a lot of credit for you know revamping the liberal arts college that was state run. But in Tennessee, you know, we have a lottery scholarship program where the smartest students, the ones that have the ACT scores, the ones that have the highest GPAs, get to go to our state institutions for free. But we also have We've also started with the last uh, governor's administration in you know the, the early 2010s, absolutely free community college for every single young person in the state, which saves on student loan debt, but also a program where people who are adults who want to go back and get an associate's degree can for free. So there's been this giant push for higher education, um, and that's been able to be done without raising taxes. Um, the way that our, our state is structured based on a sales tax, we've been able to put that money back in and it's not cost taxpayers anything. So why do you think those sorts of programs that try to bring educational opportunity and try to raise awareness in the general populace are not as popular as something that Ron, De, like Ron DeSantis and you know, revamping the school and kicking all the leftist professors out? Yeah, I, d I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I... I don't know if I'm close enough on to the ground really to to say exactly but I think that I think that people are taken by obviously taken by flashy sort of initiatives I mean I think that there's a as a general principle um then people are and especially it seems to be on on the right but I think it's probably also true on the left to some extent a lot of people are there's a lack of humility and i think that i think that people i think that people fail to realize that actually you know small humble humble things add up and you know like you might you might laugh at uh you know like some sort of local local initiative to get people to go to university who don't go to university but actually actually if if that's enacted in community after community or region after region then actually that really could add up to something um uh it's easy to make headlines, you know, or it's easier to make headlines with something like what DeSantis and, uh, you know, has done in, in Florida with the state university. But actually, these smaller, 
humble things are um they're, they're more they're more difficult for people actually to to sort of get involved with because because they they want change you know people want change and one of the things that i think we have to realize is that this is a long fight that we're in for you know tr if trump if trump gets reelected then hopefully things will change for the positive but that isn't the end of of the american carnage as he uh you know, as as he so notably um, described the situation of America in his uh, inauguration speech in 2016, um, this isn't the end of the American carnage at all. You know, this might be the beginning of the end, perhaps. Maybe that's even an optimistic, um, maybe even that's an optimistic assessment. So, you know, we're in this for the long term. We have to think generationally and we have to think not only in terms of short-term goals, in terms of flashy goals, but also in terms of more humble, long-term goals. Uh, I mean, I talk about talk about the failure of of the right to think in terms of of securing its power base, and that's that's a very very um, that's a very very timely lesson. If you look, say, at somewhere like Poland, for instance, you know, all of the all of the gains. That PIS, the Polish um, Conservative Party, uh, achieved, are, are just about to be overthrown, and part because because now there's a leftist, you know, there's a leftist uh, government in power, uh, a, a Brussels-aligned leftist government, globalist in orientation, um, because. The Conservative Party PIS in Poland didn't do what Viktor Orban is doing now, which is to create institutions or to or to change the institutions, the civil service, the universities, etc., so that actually they are staffed with people who are sympathetic, who are conservative, so that if you end up out of power, you've still got allies in the institutions. So it's actually so that actually they can put the brakes on a hostile government that takes over. PIS didn't do that in Poland. And so now, you know, the, le the left has all the machinery of government, all the institutions it needs to transform Poland in 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 record speed. And um, so, yes, I mean, I think I think, again, the fundamental point is that actually we need to. We need to get real and we need to think about our problems in a much more realistic, grounded way. I mean, I don't know if that's necessarily a direct answer to your question, but I think that it's it sort of touches on on maybe an issue that is at the heart of it, I think. Yeah, it absolutely does. And this actually leads me to my last question for you. So I'm thinking about in America anyway, the last period of this you know, red blue polarized divide was in the 60s and the 70s but even at that point you had people of all political beliefs talking openly about you know books like you know, philip roth's portnoy's complaint or joseph heller's catch 22 and going to see movies from the left and the right like dirty harry or five easy pieces or the graduate or easy writer so even though there was a sense of politics and we could divide all of these cultural texts up by political ideology, there was something appealing aesthetically enough about them to unite a culture. So fast forward to this period that we're in today, where everything is polarized and the art on both sides is absolutely suffering. Um, my question to you within that context is, do you think there is any hope for sort of a renewal of a common culture? I think that I, that, that obviously has to be the goal in, if, if we want, america to 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 continue to hang together as a nation if you want if you don't want america to break up and some people do want america to break up they talk about national divorce um uh it, but if you want america to hold together then yes it does need to have something approaching a common culture the problem of course is that common cultures take a long time to forge and you know i mean if you look at a nation like like England, you know, I mean, England as a nation has existed since the 10th century. The, the the political and the ethnic boundaries, the ethnic makeup of of the UK have been the same since the 10th century, since before the 10th century of, of England, rather. So, 
um, you know, a lot went on over a period of a thousand years to create the culture, the people that we now call uh, England and the English. And, you know, I mean, America is born out of America is born out of England. America's culture and its institutions, I think, are fundamentally cultures and institutions of the Anglo of the Anglo world. But America has moved very far away, I think, from its from its founding principles and its founding culture in a, in a short period of time. It's been that's been allowed to happen. And um, uh, I think I think in the in the short term, I don't think that I don't think that much is going to change. I think that if the right takes control and maintains control, there is still there is still going to be significant difference and significant dissent and uh there there will be the possibility of of some sort of national divorce type arrangement i think there will be there will be a, a sort of strong regionalism east coast west coast versus you know uh the interior regions south etc um but yeah i mean i think if if you want a renewed america then there has to be a renewed sense of american identity and 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 what makes americans americans what they share in common a common culture but um i don't i don't i don't know how it, i don't know how that's going to be done frankly um i mean i think it will i think it would require well one of the things actually inter that's interesting that um you know donald trump is suggesting is that there should be some form of basically like a kind of patriotic certification for teachers uh which i think is which i think is interesting and at least at least whether it will work or not i don't know at least gets at at the one of the fundamental problems for the right which is education and obviously education is part of creating a common culture and i think that i think that if the plan is to create a common culture then yes then you need to start with children with education um from the earliest age so i mean i think it's i think it's going to take i think it's going to take a lot of i think it's going to take a lot of work but it but it absolutely is absolutely is essential that that, that america have a a common culture if it wants to hang together and um i don't i don't see any compelling case for the breakup of america i think that would be a disaster i think it would be a it would be uh, obviously it would be a gift to America's enemies, but um, it wouldn't benefit the American people in any way, and they would regret it terribly. So yes, a co common culture has to be a long-term goal, but I think it's I think it's it will it will take a long time. Absolutely. Well, Rawag Nationalist, thank you so much for your time today and for the the wonderful conversation that we've had, and we look forward to promoting your future endeavors here at the Pamphleteer and. Uh, best wishes for you in 2024. Fantastic, thank you. And you should maybe you should write something for Man's World. I'd I'd like that. Maybe you could write um, a counterblast essay or a meditation and opinion essay. That would be great. And uh, please, please um, uh, let your readers know that we are open for submissions. So they should check the website and they should check the Man's World Twitter profile as well and follow. And um, uh, yeah, if you if you've got ideas then uh, submit something because we'd love to hear from you. Great. Well, thanks so much. Have a good weekend. It, it was a pleasure. Thank you.